countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Soldier Boy by Michael Scherer. There is a Scandinavian legend. In the Northland deep, in a great cave by an ever-burning fire, the warrior sleeps. For this is the resting time, the time of peace. And so shall it be for a thousand years. And yet we shall summon him again, my children, when we are sore in need. And out of the north he will come, and again and again, each time we call, out of the dark and the cold, with the fire in his hand, he will come. I was off duty when the call came to report I was off duty and out of uniform. As a matter of fact, I was in a bar, drunk. Basio had just spilled a beer over me. I cussed him out, and when I looked up, there was a shore patrol standing over me. Captain Dillon? Well, where did they find you, Buster? Did you flunk out of high school or get into a fight with your father and run away from home? Captain Dillon, I have a message for you. Well, 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 look, Basio, this is humanity's finest. He has joined the service to protect home and hearth against the savage aliens. Touching, Dylan. Touching. Are you Lieutenant Basio? I have a message for you, too. Have a drink, kid. Uh, no, thank you, sir. Well, listen to that, sir, Basio. This kid has got morale. It's a fact, Dylan. He's crawling with it. Sure, I haven't heard morale like that since the Second Martian Revolt in 23. Boy, don't you know that the armed service is a scrap heap? Do not use the best iron to make nails or the best men to make soldiers. Old Chinese proverb. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Ancient folk song. Please, Captain, Lieutenant, I'm just doing what they told me to. I'm supposed to tell you to report to division headquarters. Uh-huh. And they told you to try every bar on the strip and you'd be sure to run into us, huh? Yes, sir. Those were Colonel Swift's orders. A good commander. He knows the whereabouts of his troops. All right, boss, you drink up. Let's go. Duty calls. The garrison town was wide open. The street was lined with saloons, gambling houses, and whatever. They cleaned up this sort of thing on Earth and every colony in the solar system and beyond, but they let them stay near the army bases, mostly because they knew there'd been 500 years of peace, and the men that sifted down into the army were not quite the best adjusted of human beings. The drinkers, the gamblers, the men who were destructive in a hundred different quietly degrading ways wore the uniform of the defense command. The uniform that was usually creased and just a little dirty. I know because I'm a veteran of 20 years of it. Not a veteran of any wars nor any fighting except in some saloon on payday, but a survivor of garrison life of chasing smugglers and rally catching them. The colonel was fat and sweaty and as a gesture to military discipline, he chased a frowsy blonde out of the office before he spoke to us. Sit down, Dylan. Have you ever heard of Lupus Five? No. It's out on the rim on a 360 vertical sector. They were wiped out a year ago. Disease? Aliens. A mail ship found it. By the time they called the army in, almost six months had gone by. 
There were 70 colonists. 31 were dead. The rest were missing. All the technical equipment, all radios, guns, machines, even books were gone. The rest of the place was burned over. Only one of the men found something in the ash. As you know, every colony is equipped with a detonator in a main building. And a cobalt bomb buried right in the middle because it's a lot more important to blow a whole village than let some hostile alien learn vital technical facts about human technology and body chemistry. Well, why didn't the bomb blow at Lupus 5? Because the wire was cut. At the heart of the camp, under 12 inches of earth, somebody dug it up and cut it. Who? I don't know. Dylan, we're pulling back, evacuating the rim colonies. There's nothing else to do. No defense possible? After 500 years of peace? Look at you, Dylan. Look at me. And the rest of the army is about the same. We're pulling out. Uh, they're not going to like that out at the rim colonies. If they don't like it, they can wait and be burned by the aliens. We can't protect them. You'll report to the 38th sector. You'll have ten planets on your route to warn and evacuate. Try and stay sober. Yeah, I'll try. That's all. Get out of here. And uh, send Kitty back in uh, on your way out. We cleaned up three planets, delivered the dispatches from headquarters, and tried to find out if they had anything worth drinking in the colonies. Usually they didn't. And we were stuck with something that Basio made out of high-thrust fuel with a little lemon juice and oil of wintergreen for flavoring. We headed out for number four. Hey, uh, Dylan. Ah. Want another belt? No, not now. I gotta feed orbits into this fool computer. Light up. Come on. There she goes. You know, it's funny. What? Life. You're a 90-proof philosopher, Basio. Nah. Look, we come down on a planet, nobody talks to us. We can stand out in the landing field in snow or sand or whatever they got on their miserable planet. Nobody wants us. Well, look at you. Can you blame them? No, no, no. You don't get it. What are we here for? To save them. They shove a firecracker under their tails and get them out while there's still time. What do they call us? Soldier boy. Drunken bum. Now, what do they do that for? Uh, three guesses. Yeah, like on that last one. They almost mobbed us. Every time we walked out in the street, they looked at us as if these uniforms are some kind of a... an insult. Well, look up your history, Basio. There's been too much misery tied up with soldier suits of some kind. It's... Practically a racial memory. Ah, baloney. They got no call to treat us like we were criminals. They would have shot me down if you hadn't taken off so quick. Yeah, look, look, Basio. If somebody comes and tells you you got to get off the planet that's been home for 20 years and then wrecks their best restaurant in a brawl, what do you expect? A medal? Ah, I guess you're right. Hey, hey, that was some scrap. Yeah. I didn't like the way that stuck up head waiter called me soldier boy. I'll do it all over again. I know you would. On the next planet, do your drinking on the ship. It's safer all around. Well, they still got no right to be so stuck up. After all, somebody's got to be in the army. Yeah, I guess so. Well, that's the last orbit. Uh, pass me the bottle. The fourth planet was Norge 1. A big green world about 20% cooler than Earth temperate. They'd heard about the evacuation, and when we sent the scout down on the landing field, there was a crowd gathered. When I opened the hatch, I could smell a wet, heavy breeze that meant snow. It was below freezing, and Army-issue cold-weather gear wasn't worth much. I waited out at the edge of the field for 15 minutes, waiting for somebody to take notice of a ship of the United Earth Defense Command. I just stood there in a the cold wind with a pint to keep me warm. Finally, somebody came out to talk to me. What do you want? I'm Captain Dillon. I have a message from fleet headquarters. You in charge here? Nobody's in charge here. If you want a spokesman, I guess I'll do. What is it? Well, I uh, got a dispatch for you from headquarters. I'll look at it later. <coughs> is it always this cold? At this time of year. Oh, he's a brass monkey. Drink? No, thank you. Mind if I do? No. You have to. <coughs> I don't suppose you got any decent liquor on this planet. No, we don't have any. Uh, yeah, I forgot. All right, let's get going. We haven't got much time. They had 
had a meeting at the main warehouse. Russell read the dispatch in the order for evacuation. It took him a long time to understand. They took it pretty well, but then these were pioneers. Pioneers. Before you settle a planet, you boil it and bake it and purge it of possible diseases. Then you step down gingerly and inflate your plastic houses which harden and then become warm and impregnable. You send your machines out to plant and harvest and set up automatic factories to transmute dirt into coffee. And without having lifted a finger, you've braved the wilderness, hewed a home out of living rock, and you're a pioneer. Of course, they were angry, and as usual, they take it out on me. Now, look here, soldier. This is our planet. This is our home. We demand some protection from the fleet. We've been paying taxes for all of you all these years, and it's about time you aren't your keep. Maybe, Mr. Russell, maybe, but there is no fleet. Oh, there are a few hundred half-shot old tubs that were obsolete before you were born, and there are four or five new jobs for the brass and the government, but that's all the fleet there is. Now, look, it's 10.30 now, and those aliens might be coming in at any time, for all we know, so we'd better get going. Lieutenant Basio has gone on to the sister colony at Premit 2 of this system. He'll return to pick me up by nightfall. And I've been instructed to have you gone by then. I wanted to remind them that nobody wanted the army that the fleet had grown smaller and smaller, but there wasn't any point to it now. I realized long ago that they were right in a way. I was a big, fat anachronism, a fossil, a hangover from the Dark Ages. Only, unfortunately, we'd run right into a new Dark Ages that came from somewhere out in the stars and picked off colonies and burned them to a cinder. Well, when they finally left the meeting, I went out to check the bomb. The detonator was in the radio shack was a long metal bar with a lock on it. I followed the conduit down the wall till it entered the ground. Then I started to chop at the frozen earth to follow the wire. Uh, Captain Dillon. Yeah? How many people can your ship take? Well, she sleeps too. Won't take off with more than ten. Why? We're overloaded. There are 60 of us, and our ship won't take over 40. We came out in groups, so we never thought... You sure? She's only a little ship. She's all we could afford. Well, it looks as if somebody's going to find out firsthand what those aliens look like. It's not very funny. All right, all right. Maybe the colony on two has room. I'll call Basio and ask. Aren't there any fleet ships within radio distance? <sighs> look, the fleet is spread out kind of thin nowadays. Yeah. Yes. What's that? That's your wire from the detonator to the bomb. Somebody dug it up, cut it, and then buried it again and packed it down again real nice. Fool. Who? One of us, of course. I knew nobody ever liked sitting on a live bomb like this, but I never You figured. mean one of your people? Isn't that obvious? Why? Well, they probably thought it was too dangerous, like most government rules. Maybe one of the kids. No, no, no. There was a bomb wire cut on Lupus 5 just before the alien attack. Maybe an animal? No, no animal did that. Some coincidence, huh? The wire at Lupus 5 was cut just about before an alien attack. Now, this one was cut, too, newly cut. So something knew enough about this camp to know that a bomb was buried here and also to know why it was. Something didn't want the camp destroyed, so it came into the middle, traced the wire, dug it up, and cut it, and then walked right out again. What do we do? Pass out your guns. Try not to scare them. I'll be with you as soon as I splice this wire. <laughs> I spliced the wire and went back into the radio shack and pulled out my pistol. I checked it and primed it and tried to remember the last time I'd fired it. The snow began falling near noon. By one o'clock, the visibility was down to zero. I tried to contact Basio to tell him to hurry. He didn't answer. I figured he was probably drunk or sleeping it off. I suppose I should have been out organizing some kind of defense, inspiring everybody with grim, lantern-jawed courage. But as a matter of fact, my jaw is somewhat slack, and I'm not strong on courage. So I took a belt from the bottle and considered things. The tension was beginning to get me. After 20 years of hanging around and playing like the town drunk, a man can't be expected to rush out and plug the breach just like that. You have to work up to these things gradually. I suppose there was something to me originally, but I lost it. 
I lost it in 20 years of idiotic garrison spit and polish, in saloons and the icy looks and choice words that civilians save for peacetime soldiers. I had half the bottle killed when Russell came back to see me. Captain, I just can't make any sense of this. Who cut that wire? Well, as far as I can figure, an alien cut it. No, there haven't been any aliens or any peculiar animals near this camp. We've got planet-wide radar, and there have been no unidentified ships since the first landing a year ago. One of us must have done it. It's the only possible explanation. You mean a traitor? Or a dupe. Maybe the aliens can exert some kind of telepathic control. Uh -uh. I can't see it. If they're able to control one, why not all and save half the bother? Now, look, is there any animal that ever comes near here that's as large as a dog? Well, there's a viggle. It's like a monkey with four legs. We shoot them now and then when they get into the crops. We're going to post sentries. Do you want to place them? Well, you know this site better than I do. Post them in a ring within calling distance, huh? Dylan, what are they like, the aliens? Do you know? No, I don't think anybody does. We don't know what they look like, or what they think like, or where they come from. Do you think they've landed yet? Don't know. With this snow coming down, they could be out there in the woods right now, and we'd never know. Planet Director 7396, recording progress report on attack day. Physical situation excellent. Headquarters bunker 10 feet underground. Electrical heating apparatus running smoothly. View screens operating. Human colonists' activity not according to pattern. Eight humans have taken up watch positions on the perimeter of the colony. Original plan was for attack at night. The presence of Earth vessel dictates change in plans. The humans move quickly. They might be gone by nightfall. It will be necessary to disable their ship, proceeding on this alternate plan. At noon, Russell reported that Planet 2 didn't answer his call. Basio might be drunk, but the colony on 2 wouldn't be. If there was no answer, it was because they were dead. The people were quiet and frightened. Some of the women were beginning to cry. They brought me coffee now. It had begun to dawn on the women that they might be leaving without their husbands or sons. They had their ships stripped down and they were loading. The ones that were going stood outside and stripped off their clothes. Cold weather gear of 40 people weighed enough to get a few more on board. In the end, the ship took 46 people. When they were all loaded and they cleared the landing field and the hatches closed. You could hear the generators surge for a lift. But then there was a sharp burning smell and she never got off the ground. Dylan. Over here under the tree. What happened? The lining's burned out. She's being repaired. How long will it take to fix? Four or five hours. It'll be dark by then. It seems like they want to wait till the dark. Probably aren't many of them. Might mean that, or maybe they see better at night, or maybe they move slow. You got any idea how they got to the ship? No. You know, I've been in the Army 20 years. This is the first time I was ever in a fight. I never shot at anybody. I always figured I'd be afraid. But it doesn't seem to be any sense in being afraid. There's nothing to do but wait until night comes. <laughs> I sat there thinking of Basio. He was dead. There wasn't much doubt of that. Probably died dead drunk and not giving a solitary hoot. I stared out into the snow and thought the same thought over and over. Basio is dead. Basio is dead. In all this dog-eared, apron universe, he was about the only friend I had, and so naturally he was dead. Dead because he tried to come out here to help these people. People who cursed him and called him a drunk, which he was, and a brawler, which he was when somebody crossed him. But he was the one who came to help. And in short time, I'd be staying behind so that some colonist could jam himself aboard my ship and lift out to safety. And I'd die to save somebody I didn't even know. Somebody who 24 hours before would be ashamed to be found in my company. they come to an army for help too late. An army like me, sodden and not knowing whether they can fight or not. Dylan! What? Over there, at the edge of the woods. Something moving. You can see it through the snow. Look out. How far do you make it to that tree? About 50 yards. 50 yards. There it is, do you see? By the bush. 50 yards, no wind, half charge. 
I have a feeling I'm forgetting something. Well, here it goes. You got it! Get down. Maybe more of them. Wait and see. I saw it clear when it jumped. It was one of those monkeys. Maybe. We'll see. I waited ten minutes and then I ran over. Whatever it was was gone, almost all of it. My bolt had taken a paw and taken it clean off. I picked it up, but there was no blood. The skin was real and furry, all right, but the bone was steel and the muscles were springs. It wasn't any four-legged monkey. It was a robot. Planet Director 7396 recording progress report on attack day. Due to component tube failure, small robot unit out of control. Wandered toward settlement. Took calculated risk with poor seeing due to snow that humans would overlook it and still think of it as an animal, even firing with ports open. But a part of the robot is missing and the humans have found it. There will be no chance to disable the smaller ship now. In order to carry out total destruction, the settlement will have to be detonated. The settlement will have to be bombed from previously planted locations. I will have to leave control bunker for a more distant position as soon as protective armor is put on. I will proceed to carry out this plan. I realize this is not the ideal operation. It is more disciplined to capture humans and their equipment undamaged, but total destruction is necessary. For further operations, recommend duplication of essential controls on robots. The procedure of planting them on worlds before colonization by humans in the shape of local animals demands perfect operation when attack day arrives or the resident director planted at the same time on each world will be unable to carry through attack plans. Now leaving Bunker. That's how they got the ship, all right. Probably slipped a Viggle through the aft port and left it in there to foul the lining. What else they've got? Probably all kinds of things. Must have been some kind of lizard that went under and cut the wire. A spicer lizard. They can burrow underground. And we've got a bat that could do aerial reconnaissance for them. They know everything about you, and we don't know anything about them. They're probably sitting out there right now, swarming behind those trees, waiting for it to get nice and dark. All right, you better get back to the others and tell them I'll stay here. Why? Because we only need one. If we could just get one back to a lab, we'd have some clue to what they are. We can't just cut and run. We've got to make a stand. I didn't think the army made stands. I thought they just pulled out. Yeah, I suppose so. An army does what it has to, and ours is weak and filled with men like me. But even so, there comes a time when you have to make a stand. I stayed out there in the snow. I wasn't thinking very calmly. It was too cold. But it was probably just as well. I put in about ten minutes being afraid of whatever it was that was behind those trees. What I needed was luck. Just good, plain old luck. I didn't know where they were or how many there were or what kind, so I needed luck. I started to inch forward in the snow. There was nothing but quiet in the trees... I got past the first trunk. My elbow hit a rock and it hurt. My feet were cold. And then I heard a noise. The thing was moving down the left side of a gorge up ahead. I got up on my knees. I blew on my fingers. I threw the charge level on my pistol over to full. It was a great black lump on a platform. The platform had legs and was plodding up a path that came right past me. It hadn't seen me yet, but it would. There were five of those little monkeys skipping on before it, acting as eyes. Then one of them spotted me and started running. My first shot took the monkey in the head, and then I aimed for the lump on the platform. They got one blast off before I hit anything vital. It burned across my shoulder, my shirt charred felt as if I'd been hit in the arm with an axe. Nothing else moved. The monkeys were stiff like statues and the platform was on its side. Through a hole in the black lump, something gray and soft was oozing out. I looked around and saw the robots frozen. 
and I realized I'd got him. I'd hit the guide, the alien who was directing the robots. I kicked at it with my foot. It was too big and heavy to carry. I'd have to send someone back for it. But I wanted to take something, so I grabbed one of the monkeys by his stiff, jutting arm and began to drag it back to the village. We put the alien in a freeze tank and shipped it back to Earth. They learned a lot in the lab, but out there in the colony, we learned a lot more. We learned that man wasn't born to live out his days at home by the fire. In the wee black corner of space which man had taken for his own, other men were learning. And the snow fell in the planet's world, and when it was spring, where I had fought, men were already leaping back out to the stars. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Native Problem by Robert Sheckley, in which a misfit discovers that there is not plenty of room in space for his kind, that in fact there is less room in space for him than anywhere else. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Soldier Boy, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Michael Scherer and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Larry Haynes as Dylan, Ralph Bell as Basio, Alan Hewitt as Russell, Bob Hastings as the shore patrolman, Wendell Holmes as the colonel, and Kermit Murdoch as the alien. Your narrator was Floyd Mack. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. One of the best, one of the most popular programs on radio. That's You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx. And here's a reminder. Now Groucho can be heard on Saturdays. And he's on at a time when every member of the family, from junior to grandpa, can join in the laughter that goes with each question and answer session. A new day, a new hour. But the very same fun and good times that have made Groucho and You Bet Your Life so popular throughout the years. Have you ever met a hamburger king or an earthworm farmer? or a famous beauty contest winner. Well, these are some of those who have appeared as Groucho's guests. Who will be his guests tomorrow? Well, that's a secret, but you can bet your life they'll be full of fun and surprises. Have you ever heard Groucho sing his classic Captain Spaulding or throw a romantic line at a pretty girl? Well, listen in and you'll find out. Hear music in the Morgan Manor, Russ Morgan, live weekday mornings on NBC Bandstand.